So my name is Stephanie. Um, I started a new association for massage therapists over the last year. Um, and what we're doing is we're kind of, we're working on um, a model that actually helps out massage employees. Um, I've been a massage employee ever since I started my career. I've seen a lot of really bad things happen. Um, and so I wanted to provide direct advocacy for employees. Um, and then also the other side of it was to explore some of the larger challenges that we have as massage therapists. And the reason that I wanted to have this discussion was because I had seen a um, post in a group that we had that was made like a year ago. Um, and it was a really popular group in massage and everybody was like, they had these really good ideas on what we could do to improve diversity in our field. But like none of those ideas had really been explored or touched on or being done. And so what my thought was, was, well, I mean, if nothing else, we could at least listen, right? We could at least ask and find out what, what can we do? Like, what can we learn from, what can we learn from people who are in it, who are living it um, and living their experiences? And how can we get more people like you into our field? So, um, so that's why I decided to do this. And I am so grateful and thankful for all of you guys coming on to talk to me about it. So, um, let's start with some introductions. So why don't we just have everybody kind of go around, introduce yourself, um, how long you've been a, massa a massage therapist, um, and where you're from. So I guess so, I'll yeah. start. Uh, my name is Jet. Um, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So East Coast, uh, it's like seven o'clock here. I know several other people have said you know, seven o'clock. Um, I've been a massage therapist for 15 plus years with a specialty in oncology massage. Um, so I, I do that. I'm going for lymphatic training. I also do exercise physiology. Awesome. Okay. Mm. So can I just, can I make one request please? And this is also something since we are having this conversation tonight around like, um, you know, I'm, I'm coming more particularly from the LGBTQ community is to have everybody also state their pronouns and even put it in there um, next to their name. <laughs> so um, that's one way to be inclusive here. <laughs> so I just wanted to throw that out there in case that's a practice that people aren't used to. Uh, so... So, so I don't really go, I, I don't care what people call me. You can call me she, he, uh, I typically call my, go by uh, like the Celt because I belong to a group that recreates the middle ages and I recreate uh, an Irishman. And so I refer to myself as a Celt. Uh, <laughs> so you, you're not gonna find that very often, but there it is. All right. All right. And then Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, my name is Laura Pernick. I live in Ohio. I've been a LMT for not even two years yet. Um, just can't quite seem to find, I've had a lot of really odd experiences with management. Um, so I haven't really been settled anywhere specific right now. I'm commuting uh, about 45 minutes away to another area to work because I just live in a part of Ohio that's a little little short on industry. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not very specific about pronouns. Um, I'm the, the A in the whole LGBTQIA acronym. Um, and I don't, I mean, it's on my Twitter. I talk to people there about it, but I don't know that my Facebook family or my clients, if it has relevancy to them at all. <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. All right, Krista Beth, how about you? You hi again, everybody. Um, I love your background, Laura. I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, my name is Christabeth, and I use she/her pronouns. And 
um, how long how long I've been an LMT? That was one of the questions, right? Um, so I'm in the Boston area, and I've been an LMT for I think about like three ish years. Um, but I've been doing body work, other types of body work um, for gosh, probably close to 10 years at this point, everything from energy work to different types of Lomi Lomi uh, body work and Hawaiian sh shamanic body work and massage in that way. Um, so yeah, I've been an LMT for yeah, about two years now. So. All right. Yeah. And Daryl, how about you? Hey, I'm Daryl. I think I find myself going by DJ more often, but either one, as long as an honest attempt on my name is made, I am happy. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm probably the odd one out of the group. So I myself am not a practicing massage therapist. I am in the business of uh, massage marketing, really what I do. And so I spend kind of each and every day uh, thinking about massage therapists and mostly thinking about how can we get more clients involved into the industry of massage therapy um, and getting them taken care of their health and kind of like navigating the spectrum of what body work and massage therapy does for, for different people and um, how can we speak to those needs and, and desires in a way that is that is ethical and help people, uh, you know, hit their individual business goals. Um, I'm excited to be here because, um, you know, when Stephanie reached out, one of the things that I am personally really interested in, if anyone who is a personal Facebook friend of mine, I think for the past maybe two or three years, I forget when it started, um, I've just gotten deeper and deeper into the, the topics of inclusion and diversity, especially when it comes to race. I have my blind spot. So um, my wife is, we'll say like raging feminist, like that is her space in the world that she takes the lead. And so I try to recognize my, my blind spots in the crossover um, when it comes to discussions of gender. Um, but yeah, just excited to, to kind of help participate in the conversation um, and be here today. So um, I want to first kind of talk about like cultural concerns and challenges. And I think we should just really start with like, what is touch like for your community? Like, how do they perceive it? Um, is there a difference? Um, and then what can we do as massage therapists to encourage more of that? So let's start there. So anybody could speak up. About this piece, because this is something I also feel really strongly about. So also my energy might be strong around this because I, I do feel strongly about it. And um, I identify as part of the LGBTQ community um, and where my uh, kind of interest really lies, particularly are with trans folks. And I am not trans myself, so right, I cannot like speak for that very specific experience in terms of my own experience of it, but I have a lot of people in my life who are and identify that way. And so I've been hooked into the community in different ways for a long time now. Um, and so my concern is more about like trans people or non-binary people that come in, uh, you know, and making sure that, that um, they're, you know, feeling welcomed and feeling comfortable and um, I'm like, there's so many things I could talk about this here, but to kind of take it a step back here is like what I noticed even in school that people didn't even understand what LGBTQ even meant. So I actually like kind of did a just off the cuff one day, just like a quick 101 and people loved it. And it was really interesting for me to see like, oh, wow, like they really haven't, they don't know much about this. They haven't had exposure. They don't actually know what that means or this term means or that term means. So. Um, so I think that it comes back to just that basic education to let people know and bring them into like, Hey, like these are, uh, you know, how people may identify, but particularly why I talk about trans people is because when they come in and they're going to fill out paperwork or anything like that, like, I think it's important we have education around, um, you know, making sure we, we have like pronouns on the paperwork and there's appropriate questions to ask and not to ask. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, so I feel like we could get deeper into that, but that's kind of like where I, where I really come from when I think about this thing and what really crossed my mind when I saw your post the other day was just um, that basic education and kind of starting there. And I know that there has been some 
a couple people that I've come across that are actually like doing this work more where they're like reaching out to massage schools to be able to offer, you know, these kinds of classes to educate people, you know, and I think that's important. So, um, so, so all beings, all beings, whoever they are, however they identify, whatever their history is, can come in and feel welcome and comfortable. So I hope that all makes sense um, with, with what I just spoke about here. Yeah, absolutely. Can you go a little bit deeper into like what questions, what questions shouldn't we ask? Like, yeah, like you never want to ask somebody about their body parts. Uh, you know, it's really none of our business. <laughs> like what, if somebody's had surgery or hasn't had surgery in terms of like, what did you like in terms of their body parts in that way? Of course it is important for us to know, oh, you've had surgery. Okay. Um, and like just questions we might ask anybody that's come in after they've had some sort of procedure um, or something like that. And um, I, I don't, I want to say like, I don't know it's a hundred percent, but I do feel like people like trans people or non-binary people will let you know, in my experience and from what conversations I've had so far, of course, every person's different in what they might share or not share. And some people um, are stealth, meaning that they just, you know, are um, totally presenting, for example, uh, and going by all female everything. And so like society doesn't know that, right? And so they might not share that because it might not actually be relevant, um, but there might be pieces that may be relevant to what they want the therapist to know in terms of like health stuff, you know, or yeah, I just had, you know, top surgery, something like that. But to never, to never ask somebody, oh, I see you identify this way. Have you had surgery? Like, we don't want to ask um, any kind of really very personal invasive questions around that or more about their identity because they're going to share with us what they want us to know here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last year, has really been something, hasn't it? <laughs> and I just want to know, like, what are your perspectives after seeing everything that's been going on for the last year? Like, like, how are you feeling? Jenna, so, you want to go first? so like I myself, um, I'm lucky in the fact that because I've just started my own business, I ended up moving in with family. You know, I don't have that significant other to move in. So, you know, they were letting me, okay, build your business. And then COVID hit. And it's it's been hard, not only because, okay, people are afraid to come in. And, you know, this, this is everybody. You know, whether you're, you've got a normal immune system or not. But I myself... I, I, I'm feeling a little touch star as I'm sure other people are. So it's, it's nuts. It has been. How about you, Laura? How are you doing? Well, I was going to say, I, I understand the, the touch starved. Um, when our business closed for a while, I got a job at the grocery store and you're surrounded by people all day long and you can't touch any of them. And that was very, very annoying because I mean, you're basically out on the floor with the public most of the day. And of course I'm like, Oh, look at that guy's gate. Oh, look what their neck is doing. And it's like, Oh, you know, like I just give me five minutes, you know, like, mm, and it was, it was very, very frustrating to, to know that you had the information and not be able to, you know, tell anybody anything. Like I'm, I don't know that I'm a super touchy person, but I, I think because I don't associate like being ace, you just sort of, the way that you interact with sex and sexuality is, is different. Like it is for everybody, but we don't associate everything with sex. I just touch people and I don't really, I don't think I'm being flirty. So like in a grocery store situation, I would still touch people. It's like, you can't do that. So that was kind of hard. It was a good job though. It was super fun. Like if you're ever unemployed, Kroger, very good exercise. <laughs> I miss Kroger so much. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Honestly, it was, I know a lot of people that, and they were like, oh, that's so sad that you had to do that. Yes, it was so less sad than being unemployed. <laughs> really liked working at Kroger. It was fine. I had a fun job at the grocery store once. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and I'll tell you, um, a lot of, you know, you were saying about being ace and, you know, don't necessarily do touch with sex or, you know, you don't have that association. I'm just happy with hugs. Like, I miss giving people hugs. I love giving people hugs with no attachments to it whatsoever. It'd be great to be able to do that again. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. How about you, Christabeth? Like, how has the last year affected you? Yeah, it's been interesting for sure, right? <laughs> yes, it has. Um, wow. So I, I really, I'm a wicked touchy-feely person. Like, I, I love hugs also, <laughs> Jeff, and, um, you know, I just like people in my life and myself are just very, very affectionate. So that's one thing that, um, I mean, I do have a partner, you know, so like they're affectionate towards me, but I'm like, you know, the friend affection and like that kind of thing I really miss. And so, um, actually the, you know, year anniversary that, um, since I've kind of said, I'm not going to see people in person anymore and just like just like kind of left my offices um, and I haven't gone back to body work yet. And I don't know when I'm going to go back to it has been actually, okay. I do have some other things under my belt. Uh, You know, like I mentioned before, I do energy work and I do um, some other holistic healing modalities that I can do from a distance. So I've been very, I feel like so, so lucky that I've been able to um, pivot and kind of just try to grow business that way. Cause I also work for myself. So um, I've had some moments recently where one, one of my specialties is Hawaiian Lomi Lomi massage, where I'm like, oh, like I really miss like Lomi. I miss being able to offer that to people in, in moments, but I'm actually like, I don't, I love body work, but I am surprised at how much I'm actually like, okay, also right now, um, not missing it where I know there's definitely other body workers that are like, oh my gosh, like, I just want to get my hands on people. I just want to be able to do this work because it's right. It's what they love so much. And I love it too. Um, but yeah, that was really interesting to notice. And then having just these little pockets of moments of like, oh, like I miss that, you know, I miss that. Um, so yeah. And, and I mean, it's definitely been challenging for sure in its own ways too, (laughs) beyond beyond all of that too but yeah it was kind of like also like what is happening and and when can I get back to this or or not like what do I feel comfortable with and having to really sit with myself in that as well Mm -hmm. and how about you Daryl I know you've been kind of like watching everything that's been going on here from across the world how has that impacted you yeah, it's been a, a very interesting year. I think on the massage and business front, I can remember kind of the start of Corona because I was I was hosting like a massage event that I got pushed back a week. And I remember like day one, or I think it was a five-day event. And by day day two was like shutdown started happening. And it was like, what is, what is going on? Uh, everything was like pre-planned. So I just like, didn't have the capacity to address what was happening like live in the moment. And I can remember um, everything shutting down and kind of saying for myself of like, well, one, I have no idea what's happening right now. I was, uh, I was in Thailand, I think at the time, watching countries shut down, watching all the different states shut down. And I remember this thing of like, okay, like we're going to sort of close up shop, so to speak. Um, I think for most of 2020, we didn't, uh, we didn't reach out and really sell anything. If someone came to me, you know, after we kind of got through and figured out mask mandates, um, if people wanted help with something, I found myself like in this weird ethical spot, especially for a couple months of like, uh, actually, I don't want anyone going <laughs> into into body work. We, we kind of figured out masks and um, remember thinking if someone reaches out to me, I'll help them, but I, I'm not going out to say, hey, now's the time to, to market and grow. Kind of just like, hey, we're all just going to like hold uh, wait till we figure this out. Uh, but the other thing that I saw, like for me, when I think about um, the last year, especially is like, because of so many people sitting at home, um, whether they wanted to or not, uh, just the amount of consciousness, especially around race that happened in 2020. And it's really interesting because when I think about, um, when I think about very specifically the Black Lives Matter movement, I can remember a few years ago, it being like fringe, kind of only black people were involved. Uh, I don't really say extreme, but it was like this weird, like 
way over in the corner sort of uh, group. And then coming into 2020 with like, we saw the the Blackout Tuesday um, and um, people and it becoming like the full spectrum of like uh, all the way on the fringe to like being accepted into the mainstream and being almost cool for some people was a very interesting experience to, to watch. And one of the things that I definitely saw um, just over the last year is, yeah, as people um, raise their consciousness around specifically police brutality, especially and the ideas of race, um, people being confronted with their own race for some of the first times um, really thinking about it in in 2020 and coming in a little bit here into to 2021 and starting to have those conversations of, okay, what, what does all this stuff mean? Like, I don't really know what quite to do with this, but I'm now finally thinking about it for the first time and watching that happen. And I, I definitely have been uh, pushing that, at least in the people who have immediate access to me. Hey, hey, Jocelyn, hi. You're, we can't hear you, your microphone is off. Do you wanna take it off? Hi, everybody. Sorry hi. I'm late. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Um, thank, thank you for having us. So why don't you just introduce yourself and then we'll just bring you right into the conversation that we're having. Okay, my name is Jocelyn. Um, I live in New Jersey. I'm a massage therapist and Reiki practitioner. And um, just recently launched uh, an apparel tea, uh, a company for uh, body workers, anybody that works with their hands, because I'm fascinated by the hands and what they do. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. I know you've been in my group for a long time, so I'm really glad to meet you, and I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about what, what the impact has been on us over the last year. So I'm curious, what what has it been like for you? Like, how have you been feeling over the last year, kind of seeing everything that's been going on? Well, COVID-19 was terrifying uh, because I'm at that age. I'm 64. My face doesn't show it, but uh, and so it, when it started happening, I'm, I'm only a, I'm 64. I'm Hispanic. I was born in the Dominican Republic, and I'm black. And who would who were the people that were dying in my Hispanics and blacks and people my my age? So I felt like I had a a target on my back with COVID nineteen. Um, and uh, I I massage I do massage therapy in a hospital and plus also private clients. So I was afraid, you know. I mean, we, at the beginning, you know, they it slowed down, but they, it was still calling because I do per diem work. I was afraid to be around people. Uh, the first few months were really, really difficult. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a, a good, you know, support system of friends, and uh, but I spent a lot of time at home. I would just, you know, go food shopping, and I would do it like early, early in the morning when no one was around. Uh, and I'm just recently beginning to, you know, reengage uh, in, in the massage therapy business. Um, I, I was really, you know, plus I, I'm, I was blessed to be, you know, I received both doses of the vaccine, one in January, one in February. Uh, the hospital made it possible. Thank you. So now it's, you know, like today I was working because I do manual lymphatic drainage and I, I'm a Reiki practitioner and I spend a lot of time at the infusion center. So the people that I see are very ill. Uh, and I should add, you know, not only I was concerned for myself, you know, what if I pick up something and I bring it to my clients? Um, so that's why I, I, I chose to totally stay away for a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you serve the Hispanic and the Black community in your practice? You know, that was always a, a, a conversation in, inside my head for a long time. I mm -hmm. mean, I worked, uh, I've been a massage therapist for 15 years and I've worked uh, you know the franchises that we all know and you know multiple high ends and anytime I saw especially a black Hispanic female coming in for massage my heart would go like yeah because most of the people that I serve are Caucasian mm -hmm. even in the hospital I work in Englewood Hospital uh, 
in New Jersey, northern Bergen County, and this predominantly white. Well, Englewood has the, the railroad track division that most places have. But most of the people that I serve, uh, that I do work for, is, is Caucasians. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that because I live in a Latino neighborhood. Um, this, uh -huh. my husband is Hispanic and we live in a, um, all Hispanic neighborhood that's been around for a long time in Phoenix. Um, yeah. so this is the house that's been in the family for a long time. Uh -huh. Um, and I want, like, I want to serve this community. I, I've been thinking about just, you know, putting up a massage table in my backyard and yeah, putting out flyers to the community and having them come. Um, come. <laughs> yeah, but I don't really know you know, what, what is touch like in their culture? Do they, are they comfortable? Do they want to, right? Because I haven't really served that audience either. So, I mean, can you tell me anything about that? Well, and, and like in my, in, my, in my business, which is called the power of hands, the whole idea, the goal of this is to write a book, a series of books on, on, on how human beings use their hands either for healing, for creating, for destroying. What is the purpose and, and, and this? And you know the fact that in uterus, you can see, and you probably can hear some, but you touch. And uh, you know the, the first drawing that they found made by human in caves were drawings of hands. So hands are, you know, this is like antennas. This is our connection to the outside world for all of us human beings. Uh, in, our, in our community, I find uh, my grandmother was a medicine woman, so I come for, from that lineage of, of, of people, and people will come to seek healing. Massage therapy in our community has seen, is not in that category. It's seen mostly as a luxury. Why? Because uh, the society has made it that way. Have you noticed when they advertise massage therapy, it's usually a very slim person with perfect skin, perfect hair, and then laying down so like, mm, and you know, or you're on a vacation somewhere in Hawaii because you can afford it. No, what nobody sees massage therapy as as part of you know the healing modalities, um, and also affordability. Not many people can. You know, you know, drop down a hundred dollars plus tips, or you know, I'm a massage therapist. They, 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 you know, once they, I find, and this is no offense to anyone, once they have some some uh, experience, their prices, I know, they bring themselves above the affordability of the regular people. Uh, like I said to people, like you know, if 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 I meet someone that has an issue, and and I know that person life a little bit as how much can you afford let's work with this uh are we willing to do a massage for 40 dollars instead of 95 uh and who has the money in this country so it's, it it falls with the whole sy sy system that we have the system is designed for the haves and the have-nots and the have-nots are usually black and brown uh if you gotta pay your rent you're not gonna spend 90 dollars on a massage so i think it's affordability Presentation is presented as a luxury for the people that have, and when in reality it was never that was never the case. I went to Senegal a few years ago, and one thing that I saw that that I, I was in I'm in love with that is a, 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 a new a child, few months old. You bring it to the medicine person, normally a woman, and she will massage the baby and pull and pull and and, and you know energize that body. And it's for for, for few pennies. So the touch is is within us, just not what I do. The men that is labor massage therapy is sort of like taken out of the community. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I personally have found. Yeah, that's really interesting. I know when, when before I was a massage therapist, I was I, I did Reiki for almost ten years, and that perspective, like I know it well with the the medicine woman and the tribal aspect of everything, right? And so when I did Reiki, I charged forty bucks, mm -hmm. and I became a massage therapist, and everything went. And, and I work, you know, I worked at luxury spas, same type, all white clients, with a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. 
not really a diverse perspective. Um, you know, it was it was different. It was really different um, because we had like I had so many different people that would just come in these communities that I worked with for healing when I was doing Reiki. You know, I worked with indigenous communities. I worked with all kinds of people, right? And then when I went into massage therapy, it was just like something something different right and then i just like i stopped doing reiki i stopped doing the energy work everything was about the science of it the evidence of it right so it, that was yeah that was a big difference and i'm glad that you brought that up because yeah. it really changed perspectives right and and a lot of our community um understands energy the whole you know because like uh, i'm gonna go to, um god willing i'll be traveling to the dominican republic the end of May to meet with a couple of some of I'm gonna go in, in, in the countryside to have a couple of people that I'm gonna be in their present. I'm not saying interview or meet, I'm gonna be in their present and recording what they do. And they call in Salmista Reiki by another name, the same you know, premise tapping into the universal energy and channeling that is done in little huts many way around the world. And the person that, that does it, you can bring, you know, my grandmother, used, some people used to bring just a chicken or bring you know, whatever they had and they received the healing. Here we've separated, we separated, we, we, you know, we put healing into a pocketbook. Uh, so it left a lot of people out. Uh, like your idea of having your, your massage table and I pray you get, you know, other practitioners join in. Uh, if I live where you live, I will definitely do. And just have a day, you know, for the community, this is what this does. You know, this is what it is. I'm probably making affordable. I mean, I know it's hard to charge forty dollars because there's a limit as how many massages we could do a day. We gotta pay rent. We gotta eat. <laughs> so the limitation of of our of our bodies sort of like increases the price and once again brings it. You know, makes it that only they have the house have access to. But um, I don't know. I hope you know. I hope this can change. You know, like a franchise for like thirty dollars express, or <laughs> you know, we can oh. make this affordable. You know. Yeah, like Christabel or Laura have or and Jeff, like have any of you guys um, done anything like that, like specifically for just your community to kind of like reach out, have a massage day, like just for LGBTQIA people, like. So I haven't had a specific just for like the LGBTQ folks. Um, but I would love to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I do follow a couple of other people who do that, who are massage therapists. So yeah, Laura, you look um, like you're going to say something. No, I was just, I was actually thinking about a woman that I saw online earlier where like, do you ever hear somebody say something that kind of hurts, but it's because it's true. She made a comment about massage being an expensive hobby. And when you talked about, you know, I was thinking about like our LGBTQ center and I was like, oh, you'd need a massage chair. And I immediately thought, I don't have one of those. I wonder if they're expensive. <laughs> And then I thought of the lady talking about massage being an expensive hobby, but I, I definitely feel, you know, um, talking about, you know, doing a $40 massage. Yeah. I mean, only being two years in, I wouldn't say that I'm remotely close to being financially solvent. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty creative with my finances and I've always been a bit of a frugal McDougal, but I mean, I think if we want to see more diversity in the, I mean, I don't want to make it all about the money, but it has to be financially relevant for people. And a lot of my classmates, I mean, they work so much more than I did, you know, in terms of having to work during school and, you know, having to have second jobs and it. I don't know how they got through school, quite frankly, because I was tired for like a year straight and, and they were doing more than I was. So yeah, there's, there's something messy in the finances where we as LMTs are not making enough money to survive on, but yet, you know, we know like 
good Jewish guilt right here. Um, we know there's more that we can and should be doing. And it's, it's difficult to balance, you know, like, how do you, I think a lot of my classmates are still paying off their student loans yeah, two years yeah. out. So they're not yeah. going to be going out and buying extra tables or massage chairs, or it's just, it's not, what did somebody suggest the other day? I asked about a travel massage table and somebody suggested one, what's the company like Pisces? I almost swallowed my tongue. I think it was like a three or $4,000 table. Wow. I wow. <laughs> so I, so I, um, I got a massage chair for like 60 bucks off of Amazon. And it, I mean, it's not a high quality chair, but it does the job um, that I, I will take with me, you know, for certain events or whatever. So, I mean, that's certainly an option. Um, and I do, Laura, I do have like a massage table, an extra one if you need one. Believe it or not, I actually, this sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> somebody was retiring because she wasn't going to go back to work after COVID. So I have two tables because, okay. but yeah, my table's not, neither one of them are travel. And I think one of them weighs 40 pounds and the other one weighs 65. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I, I think That's my it. travel table weighs maybe 20. Yeah. The worst of it is it, it, it it's awkward. It's huge, yeah. you know. I swear this thing is almost as tall as I am. Uh, I never think mine is big until I have to get it into the car. And then it's yeah. like, yeah. we did this before. Yeah, it's crazy lugging that thing in your car. Sheesh. I was like, mm -mm, I'm not doing mobile. No. <laughs> you know, but it's, I, I feel like a lot of my, my, like I said, my classmates, a lot of us have gone I do massage out of my house. I do mobile. And then I work for a studio in Bellbrook because I've yet to find a way to have a single source of income that makes it work. I mean, and I think a lot of people are diverse in terms of, you know, presenting lots of modalities and, and being available to a, a wider audience. But even doing that, I can't, I have to have multiple locations because I'm, you know, I'm in the same boat where, it looks like a luxury service. I'm a paper chaser. Like that's how I pay my bills. If I can find a rich client in Columbus, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but, but unfortunately, that's where we're at. And what's going to change that? I mean, I don't like uh, where I'm at. They have a a, a, a spa uh, where you know it's like two levels, and there's a uh, there's like a waterfalls and and they have statisticians and massage therapists. Before, I got hired when once he opens, and uh, you know I'm clinically trained, and I, I love this. And and you know I, in school I was like the worst student because I think I have a learning disability, so I don't memorize much. But because of that, I'm I'm like intuitively like focus. So I'm, I'm able. It may be somewhat. I don't know what it is. God gives people what He gives. So I'm not that bad. <laughs> and I and I read and I read and I you know and, and and I take it very serious. Sometimes I don't remember the muscle, but I know where they're at. And I and, and then I let me, I can close my eyes and feel adhesions and all that. So I got hired and then I got fired because the massage protocol that they put together was if I don't want to offend anybody, it was bullshit. And I went to the manager and said, what kind of nonsense is this? She says, well, this is for our clientele. And it turned out, although it's in a very you know, affluent area, it turned out that it was for their spot, for the clientele, it's, it turned out to be mostly black and brown people. So it's like a McDonald's nice package of nonsense to our people. So not even they are they getting, you know, what all of us probably will consider to be a, a healing massage, a, you know, a massage with a purpose and uh, and, and 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 result oriented. Uh, like my, you know, I work for Massage Envy and Hannon Stone. 
I was a teacher at Hannah and Stone. I was the one teaching him, you know, the same nonsense. Uh, and, and, and the franchise, I think, have taken the profession and you go there and even there, most of the people that, 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 that buy memberships are people that, that can afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've done is like in my area, when it, the seniors, when they have a senior day at a senior center, I usually call a couple of therapists and say, let's go and we spend the day with my shares and we just massage the seniors. It's one day, but you know, everybody gets their neck, you know, the little, they get touched. Uh, my friend is in the LGBTQ community and we're planning to do an event as soon as COVID out in New York for trans people of color, which is at the bottom of the pot. So there's a center, we're gonna go and, and extend our services, you know, hang out, share massages, you know, let, let's talk, not even tip. You don't have to give me anything. This is what Touch does. Just probably to, I don't know, inspire people. Uh, you know, I mean, it, and I feel with all of us, there's a lot of us in, in, in the United States, if massage service did, just gave a little, once a year, twice a year, or whatever you have, because just like Laura, you know, I chase paper. I'm single. I, you know, I gotta pay for this luxury, <laughs> not to be out in the cold. And I understand. And the limitation that we have, the physical limitation regarding the work that we can do. I mean, with 15 years in, in, in the business, of course, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do the service that somebody that just graduated did. Massage and behind you right out of school for 17 bucks an hour. You know, but you're hopefully you're in your twenties, so you can hustle. With me, you gotta pay for my time and the experience that I've acquired. I mean, it's reality, it's reality, but uh, how can we bring it, you know, collectively in our communities? Like you wanna reach out and do so, you know, invite a couple of therapists. Somebody will, you know, the community will probably bring food. Let's have a back, you know, the community, somebody's, like, somebody's grandmother, somebody's mother will probably bring food and that's your payment for the day. And, so, you know, Plus the joy of, you know, you touch people, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can, we can start a, that kind of revolution, <laughs> you know. I love when people pay me with food. Jocelyn, you mentioned going to the Dominican <laughs> Republic. I have a family that I swear I do the whole family. Yeah. And they won't let me leave without a bottle of Coquito. <laughs> and they want me to have some with them and it's like oh this is awkward I, I know i know they will not let me go without food yeah, but the alcohol is also key they're like here yeah <laughs> i think that's awesome hey, daryl i'm curious like after hearing this conversation and knowing that you do massage marketing what are your thoughts? Like, how do we market to these communities? How can we get more involvement with our clients? Yeah, so I think there's a really wide array and I'm going to try and keep my thoughts in order because I think that I experienced that um, I, most of my clients are Caucasian. And one of the things that's, that I really struggle with as a market, I, I have to go out of my way to get tons of resources. Is I understand as a Black person how what a big deal representation is. And so when I'm like trying to build ads for someone who hasn't quite gotten photography yet, like trying to find photos of Black therapists or Black um, black clients is something that is so insanely difficult. Um, there are a few places now I started to find it more and more. And I want to give it like a huge recognition to, um, Ryan Hoimi, who he put together a huge database of massage photography. I don't think he really advertises it or that anymore. He kind of, I think is more focused on like the international massage festival side sort of things. But I spoke to him like a year ago and I had forgotten he'd given me this folder that he really went out of his way to say like let's get a nice array of representation from both the therapist and the client so that people can use this for their ads. Um, so one thing is like the the idea of representation and this has been a double-edged sword where um, I always try to include people from the community if we can uh, work with a client in Australia and he's like very, very, very LBGTQIA like friendly and trying to find that sweet spot of saying like, this is a space where you can come while also not falling into the trap of rainbow capitalism and just like pandering to an audience. And I think, I don't think we got it perfect to be honest. Like we 
kept trying a couple different angles to, to just say like, Hey, like you're welcome here. Um, we, we kind of, we don't care unless you care. I'm trying to remember the exact messaging. It was like, whatever is important to you is important to us. And if it's not important to you, then it's not going to be important to us. Um, whatever it may be, your identity, your sexuality, anything, if it's important to you, we'll be sure to address it. Otherwise we'll leave it alone. And, and some from mm-hmm. form of that messaging uh, and trying to get that out there. So I think that's something where um, I always think like when I see big companies make marketing, dis- like dumb marketing decisions. And I always know, I think it was it, um, whatever the company that was that they had like a, they had a little boy, a little black boy in the shirt had something about monkeys on it. And I can look at that and be like, yeah. wow, a black person never saw this before it went live. <laughs> like that, like that would have mm-hmm. been stopped so easily if a black person at any point had seen that and been like, Hey, we shouldn't do this. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, when we come to a marketing point of view, trying to just like, um, show something to, to someone, if you can, I know what that, I know what that feels like on the other side where it can kind of be difficult to like, you don't want to make someone the token blank, whatever, but it really is helpful to just say, Hey, I just want to make sure this is fine. Um, that there's nothing weird in here. Um, don't put all of the work on them. Just try to make sure to say like, I've put this together. I just want to see if you see any problems with it. Don't try to make them come up with something. So representation is one thing. Uh, another thing is this idea. I've talked about this with other therapists when I've done consulting. And I originally got this idea from some sort of mastermind business thing, something. Uh, I believe there's a there's a gentleman named Cole Hatter and he has an event called Thrive. And it's Make Money Matter. And it's a little bit what you expect of business. I haven't been to the event, but I know a lot of people who love it. Um, not older white guys in suits. It's a little bit of a younger crowd. We'll say like maybe older millennials, something like that. Um, But the idea is to say, how would your business and the impact you could make look differently if you had what he calls a for purpose business? An example he gives is something like Tom's shoes. Uh, Tom's shoes are priced, marketed, and sold in a way that there's enough profit and leverage for them to be able to donate another pair of shoes and that not be a huge strain on, on the company. Mm-hmm. And I think what that looks like in implementation would be very different for every kind of massage business, depending on your individual business goals, your goals for your impact. But this idea of like, um, you know, when you're thinking, I wish I could give back to so many of these people, you know, two questions I, I have are, or one question is like, how do you want to give back? Because time is one of them and money is another one. Those are two huge ones. There's of course more, but if you're, if you're charging good rates, I wouldn't even say premium, uh, you know, we don't have to go crazy over the top, but if you know that you're seeing enough clients and you're saying, I'm going to charge the good rates, when you want to donate your time or donate your money to a place where you want to have the impact then that that's huge. You don't have to stress mm-hmm. and worry about how mm-hmm. am I going to pay my bills? And that's something, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of almost sounds like just a really simple redistribution of wealth. Let me go over here, find all the rich clients, take all their money, then go over here, give them to, <laughs> to the last rich clients. Um, you know, this Robin Hood situation. And it, it can be that way, I guess, if someone wants to implement it like that. But it's kind of this question of saying, you know, what are your, what are your values? What is the place you want to have impact? And then starting to ask, okay, how do I want to have impact? Um, you know, for me, I talk a lot about race and, and my, and my own Facebook and my own life. And I kind of made the decision for me of like, uh, that's something that I'm going to keep relatively separate from the business and marketing things that I do, Mm -hmm. because it just gives me a lot more freedom to have the impact over here. So I can take, you know, when I'm making money over here in my business, it frees up the time for me to go have really in-depth conversations about race and start in inclusivity and be able to do that. So how that pays off, how that looks across for you um, is going to be different. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what I've seen of, um, I think, uh, Jocelyn, you mentioned before, of having like having a day or having an event. Um, that should, for most people on most levels of income, most budget should be able to find maybe one or two days, at least in a year, if not Mm -hmm. any more often than that, where you can say, okay, I'm going to reach out to a certain community, whether I'm going to have really discounted massage, I'm going to have free massage, or maybe I'm just going to have some sort of education. If you can team up with someone else, um, whether they be another body worker or just someone Mm -hmm. else in the community who is 
interested in serving the same community or has mm-hmm. similar values and goals, it can really help share that burden and not mm-hmm. make it feel like something you have to take on by yourself. And then honestly, like in, in the long term, because we have to both balance our income and our impact. Generally speaking, like when you do good things for people, it pays you back. Probably not it like immediately. Back. Don't expect to don't expect to like do an event and then make a bunch of money, but like that builds, you can call it karma, you can call it goodwill, however you want want to see that. Um, it will it will pay you back in some way eventually. And there's no like net loss from participating more whenever you can. So I don't, I don't want anyone to feel like they have to do things a certain way. You know, everyone's going to have whatever fits with them. Um, you know, for me, I, one of my education things, um, we're giving money back to the black women's health initiative. Um, just because, you know, it's a, they get caught in the middle of the crossover of racism and, um, sexism. So that was a place for me where I said, uh, I wasn't, you know, teaching huge things about it but i said hey if you buy something over here for me like i'm letting you know i'm giving some of this money over here Mm -hmm. to this organization Mm -hmm. and that's how i i play that out um in my own business and so it's a little different for for everyone i hope that kind of uh a lot of topics but yeah i hope that kind (laughs) of yeah that was great (laughs) i mean you know like everything starts with one person and, 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 you know, like, like in, in the business, you know, like I'm going to be interviewing people and, and although I'm, I'm very cognizant of, like, so I, I live in a predominantly white community and I'm, uh, you know, some, sometimes I forget that I'm black or, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that my eyes don't see me all the time. So I'm not only self-focused, I see out. So I see people, but then once in a while, you know, life makes you turn around so I mean, I'm talking to people in different colors, different ages. Uh, I'm going to interview a barber in Senegal uh, because you know, his hands are what he uses to work. And then I'm going to interview a, 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 a white, a Jewish man that repairs guitars in North Carolina. I just interview a, a white massage therapist that does my facial release. Um, I want I want to talk to people that you know. And, 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 and although my, my initial focus was body workers, uh, you know, I, I have somebody that does Reiki, you know, you know what, what is it to do this? And it's like bringing a community to a focus. Uh, like Stephanie, what you're doing, the whole idea, imagine if we start adding people to this panel, therapists, body workers, and, and the focus is, you know, twice a year, like you said, Daryl, give. If a hundred of us gave once a year, that'll be a hundred communities benefiting. I'm in New Jersey. I will contact, I mean, I know a lot of therapists. I mean, I'm you know, myself self is a small community wherever you live. We all know each other. I can tell people, you know, the summer is coming. There's a beautiful park. Be in your chair. You know, most people are be vaccinated in a couple of, you know, wear your mask, let's massage the people that are walking around. Uh, let's go to, you know, there's a community in North Bergen where there's a lot of Hispanics and they go to the park with their families on Sunday. Just put a sign and a couple of balloons, you know, and, and say, you, you want to try this? Like, you know, introducing massage therapy to my mother was, and, and, and it goes back to your initial question. What is that? Why is the community not so receptive? My mother was very like, she thought it was weird that she would have to get naked so you can touch her. So I will do my mother's body in parts. I said, oh my, what hurts today? Oh, my shoulder always. So I will just work that. So she saw it as a healing. It's nice to go somewhere. She didn't understand how anybody went somewhere with a dark room with music and, and candles and, and, and got naked. To her, that made no sense. So it's probably the way people see healing. And believe you me, massage therapy has nothing to do with a dark room with candles and music. It has nothing to do with that. But somehow we've bought it. It was, it was disguised like that and we bought it. It's probably time we take it back. I mean, I'll tell you, um, mm-hmm. 
I specifically try each and every day to inform people that, no, this isn't just a luxury. That this is healing. This, you know, here's what it, all it does. Here's what I do. You know, here's all of these things that get affected. And, you know, how different therapies can affect your body. How, you know, just how everything works together. So, you know, each day I'm posting some factoid about the body or how, how you can help yourself, you know, oh, oh, you, you, you sit like this all day, you know, try stretching this, try this stretch, you know, try something different. Let, you know, let's, let's start the healing process. So I, I definitely think we should take it back. You know, it is not just for happy little spa places it's you know i work with oncology people people living with cancer and chronic illnesses you know it, it's healing it's not just ploof yeah. everybody, like everybody right like when we're talking about it is our human rights everybody's human right to have access to this work and to this healing you know it, it's everybody's right everybody deserves mm -hmm. this yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. Like, have you guys, have any of you guys ever experienced like discrimination at work, hiring from clients or anything like that? I had a, as on the male therapist front, right? I had um, this couple come in one time and they wanted a massage, and I only had two male massage therapists available. And as soon as they saw them, they just literally turned around and walked out. They just, the male was like, no, I'm not doing that. So, I mean, I know stuff like this happens. It's kind of like a question, like, is this discrimination or is this choice on the client's part? Either way, it doesn't feel good. You know what I mean? So like, have you ever experienced anything like that? It's, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that because I've been trolling a conversation in a massage Facebook group for like three days now where this fellow's point is that if he were not a heterosexual male, that he would be having a much easier time. And I'm, you know, trolling thinking, so you're telling me that the fact that you're, you're a white, you know, you're the majority and you're telling me this one time it doesn't work in your favor. <laughs> now it's a problem. I mean, and, and everybody is patting his head and telling him to buck up, soldier. And I'm in the background <laughs> going, you're kind of a dick, man. Like, I'm sorry, but cry me a river. You're talking about like, you, you'd you prefer to be an aspect of society that, that could endanger you only so that you can do more massage. I, I was flabbergasted because I went through the whole comments. I thought someone... And I know it should be me. I'm a horrible person. I was waiting for <laughs> someone to say, you've really got this backwards, my friend. And everybody was like, oh, poor little white boy. I mean, it was, it was the <laughs> oddest conversation I think I've witnessed on one of the massage therapy pages in a really long time. And nobody said anything. Everybody agreed with him. And I was like, oh my God, dude. <clears throat> so I guess I could go poke the bear but like you said it's a small community so I'm not sure I want to go start in fires I I think you just had a roundabout with somebody in a massage group and I just had an interesting situation with an admin like a week ago so I'm trying to lay low but <laughs> I mean I don't experience discrimination but I see a lot of a lot of stupidity where people just aren't being smart about when they say things, they're not aware of their audience. Yeah. And I, I think I see more of that than it, like, it's not directed at me, but it's, you know, it's like, would you say that if you knew that I was queer? Would you say that if you knew that I was Jewish? I, I see a lot of that in our community, but I don't think that it's specific to massage therapists. I, I just, maybe from being home for a year, we've gotten lazy with how we think about other people or it's just exacerbated the thoughtlessness. 
I'm not really sure. Yeah, with social media too, we're behind, you know, people are hiding behind the screen, right? You don't see the actual human being that is behind yeah. that, right? Or how you actually affect that human being. And so I think, you know, like this is nicer. It's a little bit better that we can see each other's faces and we can hear each other's, you know, voice inflections and what we're talking about, right? We can see the smiles and like we have, we can see this, but like on social media, we can't see shit, right? All we have is this flat thing that comes through us on the screen and then we get to interpret it however we do, right? And it's not always right. You know, and sometimes it feels worse than it is, or, you know, it just doesn't get come across properly. So, I mean, I tell people we are, we are part of society at large, and we, we live in a, in, 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 a, in a country where racism is systemic. Mm -hmm. I was working for Hand and Stone like seven years ago. I was the lead therapist, and they pay me. $30 extra an hour to teach new newbies. I got a, a couple came in and they, they you know they had the, the and they but they had separate massages. I was giving the, the male part of the couple and he turned around and walked away and walked and walked to the reception when he saw me. And he told the manager, I don't want a black person touching me. The manager proceeded to accommodate trying to accommodate this person. And he said, oh, by the way, I have TMJD issues and I want somebody, you know, specialized in that. I'm the only one in the place that could treat him. <laughs> and the manager says, oh so, man, you know, you just, you just rejected the teacher and the only person I can treat it. And then he came in the back and he wanted to apologize. And I told the manager, well, find me right now. I'm not touching that man. I have a choice. You know, I said, you know, this is in the bylaws. We have choices. But it's incredible that if, I know in my area, if you go to Massage Envy, Hand and Stone, or the, the, uh, this couple of others, most of the therapists are black and brown. Mm -hmm. Or LGBTQ. No Ted and Ed and Timmy, none of those. So it's just like people think, you know, massage, massage is given by the same people that clean your house in my neighborhood. So they treat the massage therapists just like they, they probably treat their own cleaning ladies. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, you know, and I tell therapists, I said, when I go, I said, you know something, I don't accommodate people because I have, I have boundaries that my profession gives me. I, I don't work outside of my boundaries. I am I'm, I'm knowledgeable, go read, educate yourself. We have to, of, of, because, I mean, if you go to if you go to a hospital and the and the nurse that comes is a white male or black male, people don't do they don't I well, don't want this nurse. No, what's the difference? We're professional, you know. We, we you know we, we have knowledge. We're, we're legal. We're, you know we have licenses. <laughs> you gotta be licensed. You know. You gotta take, you know, you gotta have continuing ads. We're not different. But discrimination exists because somehow we, and I say we, and I include, we have allowed massage therapy to be taken by some people and made it whatever they want it to be. You know, because if, if I had pain because my sciatic nerve was acting up, any one of you guys that can help me, I will go. And that's what it should be with everybody in the community. Your knowledge should just be what speaks for you. Mm -hmm. I'm an idealist. <laughs> I think that's one thing that, um, that I really see is people, the public doesn't understand that we also have a choice. Yes, we are service providers, but we do have the choice whether or not to treat you, right? So people could come in, they treated me bad. I'm sure some, you've seen the clients that are like, you know, they're coming, they're grumpy and they're like, can you really do deep tissue? And can you really do this? And you can't hurt me. Like there's a lot of attitude that comes and that comes, I think sometimes with a lot of pain, right? Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, you kind of accept the fact that maybe this person's just kind of grumpy because they're in a lot of pain right now and they're going to feel better when they're done. But sometimes it's not that, you know? And they don't understand that, like we we can't we can just say like, 
sorry. <laughs> Go somewhere else, right? So, yeah. Also, um, yes. I was just gonna say, it also puts, you know, um, from a therapist perspective too, depending on the client, say there was something there, right? It puts the therapist in an unsafe situation also like we're considered the ones who like have the power in this relationship, you know, like the person's on the table or the chair or whatever it is, um, you know, but also having, you know, um, yeah, I was just thinking like off of what you were saying that, that it also puts us in an unsafe situation too. And I have seen that, you know, <laughs> there are certain people that, um, you know, that I know have experienced some just unsafe things with with certain people, you know, coming in and getting massage and then going, I don't really want to work on this person, but also the feeling of like, but I have to, especially if they work for somebody. So I know you spoke to that Jocelyn that like, uh, -uh I'm not putting my hands on that, that, you know, about that client, no way. Like I'm, but that where, you know, some people feeling, oh, but I have to go, oh, this is my job. Oh, that, you know, whatever it is around that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we serve people, right. But we're not servants. Right. Right. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, um, I want to talk a little bit, kind of change topics a little bit here. Let's talk about leadership. Now, one of the things that I had read in this group that I was in was trying to get more um, Black, Indigenous people of color, more LGBTQIA people into leadership and massage therapy. And we don't really see that. And I don't know if you guys listened to my podcast on diversity, but I really kind of talked, like broke down, like what do the boards and it look like? in our associations, right? Why are there more leaders like like you guys in there, you know, and how can we do that? And do you even want to be leaders? Like, do you want to? Anybody? You know, I, I can't say I myself want to be a leader, but if people follow me, fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm just off doing my own thing. I, I'm just doing what I like doing. Um, you know, you, you ask me a question and my brain goes, oh my God, they asked me a question. How am I supposed to answer this? Well, they want what? Um, so, you know, you put the leadership role on me. I may not do it, but if you follow me, okay, then I guess I'm a leader. Uh, you know, I, I never really thought of it as me feeding, just me doing my thing. Mm -hmm. I think talking? awareness is, uh, okay. Okay. I was like, I just, I think about awareness when I think about this idea of leadership, I, I always think about this, the concept of like decolonization and thinking about, um, most people who are in a leadership position who are, are members of a majority group probably are just like unaware of, of the systems that they play into. Now, there are people who are and they're like very maliciously and trying to keep other people down as well. Let's not pretend that everyone is just walking around and like uh, always the best intention. But I think a lot of people are, are just not aware that they don't have they haven't included some form of representation in whatever they have going on um, one of those things I think is really important to like make people aware and it makes people really uncomfortable when they are when they become aware with something of their identity that makes them feel anything less than this idea of like oh I deserve to be here um, and like I want to take people's feelings into account sure I don't want to turn anyone off but like we need People need to know like, hey, you as an individual are, are a good person, whatever, like you may not be where you're playing into a system that helps contribute towards leaving people's voices out of the conversation. Um, the other side of it is, I mean, the, the concept of leadership is kind of kind of weird. And in, in some ways, I think everyone should, you know, everyone should be a leader in their own space, whatever that means for them. There's different forms of leadership. Not everyone has to be at the head of an organization or constantly out loud on social media or whatever it may be. But I do think everyone should have some part in, I don't know, pointing things out, calling things out whenever they can, and then 
if you know if everyone doesn't have the capacity mentally financially physically whatever something that may not that may make them not a good role for the person on top um, but if anyone can find those allies find those those people because uh, there are people who are at the top in the leadership roles who once they've been made aware who are, are more than willing to kind of bring other people to the top with them i think uh if people can't kind of make their own path to the top go find those allies kind of see look for the hints and find the people who are open to the having the conversations of like hey you know i don't know if you realize your board has no people of color your board has no um lgbtq people um would it be okay to have this conversation maybe if not you jump in on the board whatever it may be those sorts of things i think are really important just because you know for me i tend to lean on the side of like i'm just gonna go make my own path gonna go climb my own mountain and say like hey here i am at the top but i know that's not it for everyone and i think it would be unrealistic to ask that of every single person we're so fragmented like the boy in jersey and and i'm not you know i'm someone I'm like jet, you know, like I, I try for many years. I traveled solo. I was this weird, you know, conflicted, really broken down person. And I had to do a lot of work to mend myself. And I find by mistake, this was in massage therapy. I didn't even know I was going to be good at it. And I am. Uh, and then I try, you know, I'm looking from afar, you know, I'm like, a, like the, but the, the board here, and I've been in, in a few board meetings, they're most, mostly white people. Uh, and, 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 but one thing I noticed is our profession is fragmented because every state has different little rules. Although we all do the same thing, it's like divide and conquer. I would like to have like a national like group, you know, that we have in a database, all the crap that every state requires of us. But somehow, some uni unity, like you, you know, wherever you, you, where are you, Stephanie? Arizona. Arizona, yeah. I'm in New Jersey. Dara, where are you? I am overseas. Overseas. So, so see, uh, I mean, but even anywhere we live, we do the same thing. We all do the same thing. Do we need to globally unify, or unify just in a, in a community? And then depends where you come from. Like in Bergen, in New Jersey, you know, the, the systems in place, everything, all the boards, and there's mostly white people. Why don't we join? I mean, this a lady that's been trying to, there's three seats open for the past three years. I don't know why. And you can email them and, you know, request, and there's never a specific answer. Nobody knows. It's like impenetrable. But you know, should we start just disregarding these bored people and just you know what we're doing right here? And start like when you started, this this could be a movement that can grow. You know, one therapist invites another therapist, and before you know it, we need like a, a mega zoom to accommodate the thousands of people that are gonna be doing that and give people a minute because you can't talk too long, or there's 900 other people that wanna talk. I mean, you know. We can do this. <laughs> yeah, we can do this. Right? Yeah, we can do this. Yes. Yeah. Um, Chris, Matthew, or Laura, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, whew, it'd be nice to see more diversity in leadership for fucking sure. Excuse my language. Sorry if nobody likes snoring. Um, I feel you, bro. I feel you. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, you know, to to kind of what you were saying, Daryl, is is that like being a leader in your own life kind of thing. Um, I think you were speaking to that a little bit, and I just feel very, for me, and and just um, how I live and what I believe in. You know, I really try to like live my best, my my best self, and my my like really be my own leader in my life and live the way that, um, you know, with the best abilities I can to like be as inclusive as possible in my own life in the way that I also run my business too um and then seeing you know like I was talking at the very start of this like school and like even just basic kinds of knowledge in school to be more like educated inclusive on certain topics and 
you know, um, write that not every person that comes is, um, uh, you know, going to be like one particular type of person. Every, every person is different and to just like have more from leadership, like they need to be educated though, right. To be able to, to, um, to offer that education to the students. Um, so that's kind of where I think about it, but of course the two, like they, we were saying Jocelyn and um, different boards and things like that as well to be able to be like, hey, like actually where am I represented? Um, do I wanna be in that leadership role or not? I love leadership stuff and I personally am like, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, yeah, put me in, <laughs> let's go there, let me do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, I don't know. <laughs> But it's important. It's important for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely would like to see a lot more of that. Um, I think that having a small groups of white people is probably not the best way to run a profession as diverse um, and that serves so many different types of people that as we do, right? So we really need to come together and try to figure this out and how, like figure out how do we make this work better in the future? Because I think, you know, there's this, been this like really beautiful evolution of like gender and sex in our country. And I've seen it grow from like gay pride marches, you know, to all of a sudden we're talking about intersex. We have new pronouns. We have all these new things we're talking about. And it's been beautiful to watch it grow but, you know, people get left behind, too, when they're like, what, what does that mean? Like, what is the IA? Huh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, like, just to watch all of this, like, we have to start being, like, so much more inclusive in our community, in our massage community, all together, you know, and what we're doing. So, yeah. Um, and then race, like, that, I feel like there was this kind of, like, people were like, oh, I don't see color or, or you know, whatever, right? Like, but I know, like, how do you not see that, right? And, like, when this whole thing started with Black Lives Matter for me, I was just like, holy shit, this is, I cried. I mean, I had, like, an emotional response to that. And I was just like, man, like, anything that I could do to make this better, that's what I want to do, right? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What, I, what I'm about to say, and and I don't mean it to be offensive to anyone, but you know, like I will in, in, in a in, in a safe space. I feel slavery was abolished how many years ago, and it's still very hard to be black in this country. The pronouns changes recently happened. And he has found a place in society. I don't have any, you know, I'm old school. I mean, my I see you, you a girl or a boy. I'm, and, you know, but I have a lot of friends, you know, in the LGBTQ community. And I, and I ask, what would you want me to refer you as? I ask. And if I forget, I apologize all the time because I'm, I'm training my brain. So we, were, we are so focused now on, on, on the pronouns. And we still, and it's still difficult to be black. Something is wrong here. I mean, it's like what it seems like this society only serves who it serves. It's, so, you know, I, I, I think the conversations have to be right in the open, you know, like without offending or attacking, because, you know, Based on what we do, you know, this is what you know, this is what we use. And you know, once you're in a room with someone, I tend to close my eyes a lot when I'm working. Yeah. And you become what tissues and tendons and ligaments and must do you become that to me? So we are we are actually the colorblind ones. We are. Mm -hmm. You know, based on, on the and the work we do. We are, but nonetheless, you know, we know that, you know, racism is still exist. And, uh, you know, if we're gonna, you know, if, if, if we're gonna open the, the you know, the, the, the spaceship to one person, you gotta be open to everybody else. 
know. So are we gonna do this again? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, let's talk about increasing diversity in our field. How do we get, I mean, there's some ideas about like opening massage schools in lower income areas um, so we could get more BIPOC people into our field, right? Scholarships, like mm -hmm. how do we, how do we do that? I feel like in my mind, Okay, I'm talking from my white person mind here. Like in my mind, I'm like, does a black person want to serve a white person? Right? I ask these questions like, like, do they want to? And it, you know, in this role where you're just kind of like you, you're giving, you're you're serving somebody in this way, right? You're serving a rich white person. Right? Do they really want to do that? Does it, I mean, like, what is their feeling? Because I feel like if I was, if I was you, I would have a feeling about that. That probably wouldn't feel great to me, you know, but, but I mean, like, I don't know. How do you feel? Right. Like, can we get them in the community? Can we sell massage therapy as a wonderful thing for them, for their families, for their communities? Can we, what can we do there? Right. It's a service. There is something very, I don't know, like the word service, like my mother asked me, you know, why would you want to do that? You got to be touching people's feet and, you know, it, it's, it's the word service. We don't, I don't offer, I don't do service. People ask me, no, I don't do services. I won't make you fries. I don't bring you water. That's not a, a what I, I do massage therapy. I do therapy. I don't offer a service. I think we gotta erase that word from what from what we do. I, in my area, most of the schools, and when I was at Massage Envy, no, when I was at Hallen Stone, I used to travel to many different schools with the manager recruiting. Most of the students were brown and black people because it's an expensive the training. Is short and the school promise immediate work. So if you know most people are having a hard time in high school, you know, they get recruited, they go to massage therapy school, right there, they, they get fed into a franchise. Mm -hmm. Because it's a service. So they be they, and and then the work is done that way. No, you don't know, you don't want to serve people that are gonna look down at you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, like that man that I mentioned, I was not going to touch him because to him, I was not even human. He did. He denied me just because he what he he saw. He didn't know what was happening in here. But but we don't have that choices in many places. I I I, I don't even think I had the choice. I was just crazy. He put me in that place. That like f you. But if let's remove the word service, and uh, out, out, of, out of what we do, and probably more people, and and then increase the pay. <laughs> Yeah. You know, most of you know, seventeen dollars to do a, a dead tissue massage for an hour. Yeah, yeah. Not enough. No, it's not. It's not enough. It's not enough. Not enough. I See, I think there was a lot of diversity when I was in school, but then all the those students got fed into the massage mills. Um, I don't know if elements of massage is common in other places in the United States. In Ohio, they're huge. Mm -hmm. but, okay. I think they started um, in Ohio. They're here. Yeah. That's probably why I'm more from, I'm, but all three of them came to our school like multiple times. And a lot of our students, depending on, you know, how many hats they're wearing in their life, if they're the primary breadwinner and raising the, raising kids and now they've got these student loans you know we did learn a little bit about starting your own business but you know they didn't talk about how much it costs to hire a cpa and then you have to file for your llc and you know those expenses are unrealistic for people that are already mm -hmm. doing two or three jobs personal jobs they don't have a choice but to go to a chain because they have to start working 
immediately. They don't have the gift of time to be able to do some of this stuff. So I think getting diversity in the schools isn't necessarily the challenge. Um, my class, I think, was 40 students, and it was probably about one third African American students. And then there were at least five or six, like somewhere on the queer spectrum. A whole bunch of us went to massage mills. So I don't think getting the students to the schools is the challenge. It's there's nowhere to go. There's no up. You yeah. know, like when you're talking about getting them into leadership, they basically leave school and then they go right into survival mode. I mean, like I, I was only at Elements for a month. It was obscenely stressful. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if that's your day to day, leadership and management is important is impossible there's mm -hmm. just it's asking you don't have any brain cells left like <laughs> yeah. so yeah i think it's more that there isn't i've often questioned why we don't have like an internship or apprentice program i'd love to work under somebody and every job that i've had i've had three managers now their response to when i have questions about things is oh it's on youtube Mm -hmm. this is this is everybody so you know if you don't have those resources or your only resource is youtube yeah there is no up so i think we have we have people we just there's nowhere for them to go no nobody's massage envy is working on putting something like that in place you know they will pay for your education a portion of it and you got to work for them for you know so they just they just producing like you know massage therapists by the by the thousands to yeah. work for them and, and, and they're really yeah. uncomfortable yeah it's like a, it's little soldiers and 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 when i worked at, at the franchises the manager from the manager to the nobody knew nothing about massage therapy Oh no, no, it's a and, and and the leader it was usually someone like really like what you know and, uh, and if you go there because they have a protocol, it's just you know push them push them out and they won't just like they want anybody to do the tissue, just elbow these people and you know get them going. And they want you to do seven of those or eight a day. Uh, yeah. Jocelyn, you're me. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's like I don't know. I wonder how much collaboration and in the sense of business is happening because this is a really good point. And this is something that I get to, I get some le high level to see when I'm talking to a lot of people is that um, if people go to school and they go get a job, you know, just another cog in the wheel. Uh, some people do, do get out and then they go and they build something grand and they're able to hire other people. But for a lot of people, it's go to school, start my own business and a lifestyle business. I'm just in business for myself. And because of that, it's not like a, a bad thing, but then that totally changes the, the opportunities available and the styles of like, you know, this idea of having an apprenticeship uh, sounds really great. If I go and I look into any given random city, there's going to be the massage envy, the hand in stone. There's probably going to be, you know, depending how big the city, four places that have multiple therapists and then like a hundred one person massage mm -hmm. therapy businesses because everyone wants the they want the the freedom that you know they've been sold to I, I i've seen from experience not everyone gets the thing they want when working for themselves but everyone's kind of chasing that and i don't think then people are aware of like all these individual pieces kind of like playing into a, a system that contributes to not having that many opportunities because everyone wants this exact kind of client or have this exact schedule or have this exact location, which I don't think, I don't think anyone should, should not want that. I don't think anyone's at fault for wanting those things in their own business. That's just the, the other side of it. You know, when you see um, like the small buildings where there's like, there's four massage therapists with four completely independent businesses right next door to each other in the same building uh, you know, what could be possible if it was one business and what sort of, you know, impact could they have? What sort of opportunities could they provide for other massage therapists who are getting out of school? It would probably be a lot greater. So I think that's something that is, I'm not sure how many people are aware of as they're kind of like head down. I got out of school. 
I either I need to make money or I want to have my own business and not seeing just kind of what's happening around them. I think that's a really good point and something that I have been talking about because, you know, the article, there was an article that came out of Massage Magazine about massage collectives. Um, we've been talking about trying to figure out some way to provide education on how massage therapists can set up cooperatives, right? So we set up a co-op and then you have profit sharing, right? You can have a, a better location. You can have, you know, a beautiful environment. You can, you can like pass up this, the aesthetics that the franchise had, right? And then all of you together can have your own, like, you know, just beautiful, fantastic environment where you can reach out to so many more people, serve so many more people, right? But I don't think that therapists know how to do that, right? I think that's something that's kind of like elusive. I know of like two massage therapy co-ops, maybe, you know? Um, and so that's something that I really want to start putting out there more is that like when we're together, we really can do a lot more than we can by ourselves, right? We're not mm -hmm. isolated anymore, right? We're not by ourselves anymore. We can really make a difference. Right? and make a difference in each other's lives just by working together. Like it's not that, you know, it's not that hard, right? Yeah, I think it should start to become, I think it should be considered one of the normal things. So like before I was in the massage industry, I was involved in the dental industry a lot in private practice medical. And that's like so normal. Yes, there are like big chain dentistry places. And there's like, we kind of see the same thing of big chain versus private practice. But a lot of people understand and know that like there's this thing in the middle of like okay uh, maybe i'm going to buy into a practice or maybe um, we're going to do some sort of revenue share or something where i am not having to brunt everything by myself i think it's one of those things where like the barrier to entry into massage compared to other professions is quite low um, you know you can get in and maybe two years of school um, some places are longer, maybe some places are a little bit shorter, depending on, on the state and then bam, immediately go and start a business. Um, and so it's like, yeah, kind of a, a lot of people running around doing their own things is like, if we stopped and paused for a second and examine the possibilities, what can happen together? Uh, it could change, it could change a lot of things, set a lot of new, new normals and present people with opportunities. They had not realized they had can, um, were, were available to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things like um, Sandy Fritz, we did this business owner panel earlier today. And one of the things that I found in the franchise environment, right, they have like a cooperative buying scheme, right? So when a bunch of franchises are together, all of these owners get like discounts on their products, they get discounts on their um, equipment, they get discounts on their, um, you know, just all the things, their software and all the stuff that they buy in their business because they are part of this kind of like collective where the companies, you know, they're buying in bulk and they're distributing to their own companies and they're they're getting like huge discounts on all this stuff. So that's really nice. That's something that I would I would think that a bunch of individual massage therapists in one specific state or location, like if they were part of a cooperative model, they could totally do that. And then all your overhead costs go down too, right? So that would be really helpful. I want to say as a, as a side note with that, uh, surprisingly, that can be easier in some cases. You don't have to be AMTA or AVMP to do that. Uh, when I worked in the dental industry, I just had a, a client who's just a guy who had a big Facebook group and he would like, as he himself would reach out to companies and say like, hey, I have this community of X dentists. Can you negotiate? Um, can you negotiate something on our behalf? for if we want to buy from you. Uh, that's surprising. As long as you have a group of people, um, for anyone who sounds like, oh, that's really good, it doesn't have to be that large for companies to listen to you and say, okay, yes, cool, we're interested. Here's what we can offer your people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't even have, I did, um, I called the, the Kinesio Tape Association. Um, there were some misogyny employees that were having some issues with the training that they received and I heard about it. And I just called this company and was like, hey, um, can you guys do anything to help us out? They gave us an entire year to the Kinesio Body Taping Association, a free membership, um, a discount, like a $300 discount on the class for any massage employee that wanted to sign up for Massage Envy. Um, and then they gave discount discounts on all their products too. 
And I thought that was awesome. And I didn't have one person that was like, yeah, let's do this class. But they were like, hey, if you put this out there and you get like 10 people who are Massage Envy employees to sign up, then yes, you can have all this. And I was like, wow, that was awesome. You know, so it's out there. Like, you know, when we're working together, we can get it. And I love that. So um, we only have probably like 15 minutes left um, on our discussion. So I wanted to kind of talk about like, the future of massage therapy, um, you know, what ideas, what can we do to start actually increasing this diversity? How can we get more therapists in? Um, and what, like, what would actually make massage therapy an appealing career in the future? I feel like there's kind of been this, like, we've seen a lot of retraction, maybe not a lot, but we've seen quite a bit of retraction enough to be noticeable during COVID and all this other stuff. So like, what do you guys see for the future? Like, what do you think we should do? I kind of wish I was more, this is going to sound corny, but I, I still kind of wish I was more involved with my school. I, I sometimes wonder, like, Ohio has recently said they're going to decrease the amount of education hours, which I find concerning. Um, but I wish, like, you know, when you go to, like, a school or you're, you know, maybe going to summer camp and you get, like, a letter from that, I wish there was a way to synchronize recently graduated or, or soon to graduate students with someone, even if they're not like, I know we can talk on Facebook, but you know, sometimes you're going to have questions about the industry where you're like, this is kind of embarrassing. And I feel stupid asking, but mm -hmm. what do you do when, you know, this happens? And I don't know that I have enough information to mentor anybody, but I think it would be cool to have a little massage minion, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where <laughs> they could write me and say, you know, like like when I first got out of school, okay, like in school they don't teach, you, you don't do glutes. There's, there's no glute work. I had to figure it out practicing with friends. Like it'd be really nice to have another LMT to be like, how do you get the towel to stay on their butt? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the kind of stuff that, we've all had educational experiences where they don't really teach you everything you need to know. It'd be cool to have more direct connections with somebody who's going to be able to say, oh yeah, if you do this. One of my coworkers the other day, it was something I'd thought about for like two years. I'm like, why is it so difficult? And she was like, oh yeah, you roll up a towel in you. And I was like, are you kidding? It's that simple. It's really that simple. And I was never going to figure that out from YouTube. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. never saw the whole time I was training at Elements. I just, I slightly more interpersonal communication because I feel like everything we do is on YouTube and not YouTube on Facebook. And it, it doesn't always, it doesn't always hit the mark. It can't, mm -hmm. it's too broad. So yeah, yeah I wish probably. I was more involved with school somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's also really hard on Facebook. Like we live on Facebook, right? Massage therapy lives on Facebook in these groups. And it's really hard there too, because you ask a question and then you get like, you know, just a pish posh, like whatever of answers that you're just like, some of them are smart ass. Some of them are just like, they make no sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even know who's talking to you, right? So whoever answers you, you're just like, it, it's just kind of like gambling, throwing your questions out there, right? Like you don't know if this person has experience or you don't know anything, right? So that's not really the best place to get those answers either, right? Well, and you don't really know who's like-minded. I mean, it's hard to read tone. And, yeah. you know, I think if you have a more direct connection with specific people, I think you're, you're gonna get more exact information there's, I think there's less of a barrier because you understand. And honestly, I think it'd be a good idea because based on Facebook, some of these people, it's like, what's your massage voice like? Because this on Facebook, you're horrible. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like, really, do you talk to your clients that way? <laughs> you gotta wonder. So yeah, maybe we all just need a little more practice you know, text or email or Zoom, or I don't know what the answer is, yeah. but it's like some of them have been in quarantine too long and it's like, ooh, yeah, no. 
<laughs> the whole thing, unfortunately, we have the, the franchises that are, you know, that are developing to, di to, you know, dinosaurs of the industry. Enormous, and they're going to ingest everything. It is what it is. If, you know, and I, I, I had a meeting with, you know, a, a conversation with one of the franchise owners that said, you know something? Okay, so you guys are growing like a huge, whatever it is, you know, give people better money so I don't have to have two jobs. Provide medical insurance. How many massage therapists and the franchises have medical insurance? No. So if you, so, and you only work, you only get paid if you work. God forbid if you get injured, you have a problem. And they, they recruit fresh out of school. In a year, you know, if I have to learn the whole body and how to execute a massage, I'm gonna come out with 10% of one thing and probably 5% of the other. Have in-house experienced massage therapists, pay them better so they can teach and, you know, and continue, or often continue education. Not the one you think they, they design or really valuable continuing education. Because this is a profession that you need to grow. You know, when you finish massage therapy school, you are licensed to practice. That doesn't mean you know anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my first, you know, the first massage I did, the woman thought, uh, you know, it was wonderful because my hands are very warm. <laughs> and she loved that. I had no idea what I was doing. I could barely effleurage. It took 15 years. Now it's like I feel comfortable when, you know, someone lays on the table and, and gives me an intake form. Now is that I feel comfortable and say, okay, this is in, two, in, in the minute and a half that you have between picking the client up from the reception to the room to formulate a, a treatment plan. Teach people how to do treatment plans. They give you the same massage. You know, so I think they're responsible for the, the decay of what's going on. You know, the big corporate, so they, they, you know, it's, it's in their hands, not the individual people. They can, most of us are working for one of those. Or we're working by ourselves, like, like Laura said, without, without mentorship. Who do you call? You know, like, you know, somebody has, a, I mean, if you have a client that has a condition and you've done everything that you know how and it's not improving, you should be able to call Stephanie. I mean, I got this person, I've done A, B, and C. This is the condition. What do you think? And then Stephanie will give me her experience. You know? Yeah. So we, you know, I mean, probably create a pool of that where people, you know, can don't feel uncomfortable saying, you know, something, you know, this this person's, you know, condition is not responding to me. It's not that I'm doing anything wrong. What else do I need? What else do I need to add to my bag of tools? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea. The, Medic, the American Medical Association has something like that. I think they just called it like the Human Research Project or something. Mm -hmm. If you go on AMA, you can find it. But they have doctors who are specialists and they have this chat app where a doctor can just go on and say, hey, I have this client with this condition. And the other doctors who are specialists in that condition can just answer the questions, right? And usually, you know, they kind of rotate like who might be on this thing at any given time. And I think that would be awesome for us to have something like that, where we could just type right in, say that I have this problem and like a real actual person who specializes in this can help us, right? That would, I mean, wouldn't that be fabulous if you could access something like that? That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great for all of us, no matter what stage of the profession you're in. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just created a, a protocol to, Treat take you know, TMJD because I'm a sufferer, and I'm gonna present that at the hospital uh, because they want to get clients. And I give the, the the protocol that I did to the manager, and she changed some stuff. She first she labeled me as a certified massage therapist. I said no, that doesn't work. You have to be licensed because if you say that I'm certified, that means it's illegal, mm -hmm. you know. And but she's using this not because she thinks. The information that I have is valuable. It's just to attract clients. Uh, but we could do that. We get you know people could do presentations on, on the speciality, and you can view and you can see them working or explaining them. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
So, Christina, did you have anything about like the future? What do you want to say? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Also, I'm sorry, I'm like super starting to fade. So I'm like still with you, but like my brain's like- We have like five minutes left. So I just <laughs> wanted to give you a chance, no, no. right? You're good. Um, yeah, like I really love what everybody's saying tonight. And it's making me just really think about um, people working together more, you know, like as a collective or having there be more cohesion or having there be more community really in certain aspects. I know that there's lots of different massage communities out there, you know, like for example, we keep talking about Facebook, not always the best, right? Like not always the best, but it's possible that there are um, absolute communities out there, you know, to be able to hook into or to create community as well. And it just reminds me of um, when I was doing body work, um, I do work for myself, but I also worked for a chair massage company in Boston. I met so many awesome massage therapists. I like couldn't wait to go to gigs because I would see so many different people. And we like, I felt like I really was part of this really fun, cool community. And everybody was so different in like their passions or their specialties or their background, where they've come from. And we were able to all really share with each other in this beautiful way. Um, and I'm like, oh, I miss that. I miss seeing them. I miss seeing those people. And in that community aspect of, being together of like doing the work together and also being able to uh, talk with each other about things too, or just know, Oh, I know I can like contact that person or I can send a client to that person because they specialize in this particular thing mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. So, um, you know, and also like how there was, you know, this talk too of being able to like uh, this client has this thing and they're not responding to me and being able to like, you know, get on the computer or call the thing. Like you were saying with the APA, how they like have particular, um, you know, part of that organization or whatever it is, the association that, um, you know, people could access and it would be part of it. Cause it's so important because the work we're doing is really beautiful and really incredible and really, really healing. If we let it be that, if we let it be that, and it is, um, but also, and also like, where can, where can we like find more support, you know, with that as well. Um, and of course, like to see all the diversity in all the ways for sure. And, and to have people like be more educated around all of those pieces. I feel like all of that, all of it's really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you, Daryl? What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I think something that would just be the benefit of everyone. I always think about um, how can we get people out of being in a sense of scarcity? And we'll just like exclude 2020 being like a, a year that I like, put everyone up against the wall. Because um, it's, it's a lot easier to make some of these decisions when as a therapist, you're not thinking about I need this client or else like I need this money or else of being afraid to call someone else being afraid to, you know, go into a co-op because you're thinking that's my competition. I, if, if we work, you know, they're going to take away money from me. Um, so that's one of those things where there's, there's lots of pieces that, that go into that education of like the general um, of people in general, about what massage can and cannot do. And then presenting those opportunities to make those a lot more normal conversations for a therapist to have with each other. Um, I only see that as the, the benefit, you know, I, I see like how different it is in, um, in Canada compared to the United States, especially how, how the work is, what's the education that goes into it, what the expectations are. And I see a little bit more of this, this pivot into, you know, it's a lot more medical. Um, and people come from that sort of place more often. I think that's really useful while also not saying like, if someone wants to have a spa, like they should be able to have a spa. I think that's that's okay, navigating that spectrum of what body work does. So I think it's really important. The other thing I always think about is just from a client experience and something that feeds, in, you know, feeds into everything. Uh, I always think of the idea of representation. I always think for myself of... Um, Whenever I think of like, oh, I don't care if someone is trans, or I don't really care if someone is LGBTQIA, whatever. And then I remember for myself, like, in a place where people would say, oh, I don't care about race. But when I see representation, how big of a deal it is. And seeing like, this, this is someone who sees me, hears me, feels me. 
um, this is, this is awesome. And trying to remember to say like, you know, as, as therapists on, on, let's say on websites and marketing and things like that, trying to make an intentional effort to have a lot more representation, speak about different topics is something that I think will just help that be more normal. I would like to hope that starts to, to drift upwards. Uh, Like I'm aware sometimes, you know, if you're part of a minority group, like your existence sometimes becomes political. Um, And it's something where that's, that's so really important to kind of remind people like, Hey, I exist in this group, this group of people, whatever it may be exists. And it's important. And we have a, a unique set of needs and challenges that we would hope to be addressed. And no, does like, does like race, for example, play into every day, small details of massage therapy? No, not, not really, but knowing that there's that someone like has an idea or has some level of awareness is something that can be, can be great. I know. Um, I mean, for me, I'm overseas and like conversations about race are very different outside of America, but my sister, like she will go out of her way to either find either a black therapist or someone when she looks at their website, like, do they have some indication that they've worked with black people before in some way, shape or form? Like that's super important to her. She's out there looking for that. I think that's something that's just that, that I think will, would be nice to be start to become a norm because then then people will also start to have those questions of like, Hey, I'm doing this here. Like I start to notice this lack in all of these other places. How can we do something about that? I think it's a very easy call to action. I want everyone to put pressure on like governing organizations and everyone to put pressure and and start to demand more. But if, if every person can just start to be aware, push for more representation, Um, and the stuff they put out there. uh, I think it's a a very easy, like digestible thing that can make the industry better for the therapist and for clients. Talking, but you can't hear me. There we go. (laughs) Uh, Did did you have any other comments before we kind of wrap things up? Honestly, not really. Um, You know, like Krista Beth, I'm, I'm fading here and most of the things that I have thought about everyone else has said so uh, I'm gonna bow out of this and you know in the final remarks okay anything else anybody no I just want to say Daryl you have the most pleasant voice and if you ever want to go into ASMR videos you should definitely do that I would be here for it because it's, <laughs> I'm surprised you don't work in the salon, honestly, because you, you kind of have a spa voice. <laughs> You're not utilizing. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's very uh, I appreciate relaxing. that. I always hated my voice. I appreciate that a lot. No, it, no, no. It's, it's very, very pleasant. Yeah. Very pleasant. Yes. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it was really nice to meet all of you. If any of you need anything at all from me, please email me. Let me know. Let's keep in touch. Um, If any of you are interested in any kind of leadership in what I'm doing or you want to know more about it, I am totally open. We'll talk about it. We can discuss it. And I would love to have any of you serve on my board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Nice to meet you all.